Okay, we can get started. Uh, is everybody inside? Uh, my name is Richard Larn. I'm the Programs Director for the Arizona Photography Alliance. And uh, today we're uh, lucky to have Becky Semp uh, talking about her book about Ansel Adams. A couple of uh, upcoming events I wanted to mention. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Oh, the, uh, yeah. So that's a picture of the book, which is for sale today, and you can get the author to sign it. I'm going to do exactly that after the, uh, after the lecture. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, an announcement we're making that uh, North Lake Gallery, the School of Art at ASU, is bringing in Arno Minkinen. Uh, and his work is just fantastic. And I've been looking at it for really literally decades. Uh, he photographs himself nude in the landscape. Uh, it's unlike any other photography I can, I can really think of. Uh, I mean, it, it, I'm not a nude in the landscape kind of guy, but I'm really interested in what he's doing and, and how he's kind of celebrating being in the landscape. And he's a very uh, long-term teacher and a very gentle person. And I think it's really gonna be a great event. So it takes the form of, uh, we're gonna sneak in before the opening and uh, at Northlight and have an hour with him privately, um, the group. Uh, so that's coming up on the 19th of November. That's a Friday. Um, so save the date for that. We can go to the next slide. So we are, um, we also, oh, I'm gonna hand this over to Dennis Collins, who's gonna talk about the book sale that we have just for a minute. Well, I think everybody here pretty well knows who I am and I'm gonna be inviting a bunch of people over to my home. Drew, Jeremy Rowe, uh, a family donated about 20 boxes of books. The deal was that we split what we sell them for, the family gets half the money, the other half of the money goes to the AZPA. We had Sid, or not Sid, but Susan, uh, Chris, Fred, and I last Wednesday went through the books. We, we got through about 75 of them. We only went through four boxes. So that means there's about 15 more boxes to do. Some of the books, if you're a book lover, you know what it's like to be the first person to open your book, the pages, the way they look, the way they feel. We found books there that looked like they'd never been touched. It looked like no one had ever opened them. And then we found other books that looked like they'd been lovingly handled for many, many years. So we have uh, a chance, the 16th and 17th, I want about four to six volunteers to come to my home. We'll provide refreshments. We're categorizing all the books so that we know what's there, doing a little inventory. Then I'm gonna go through a number of resources I have to find the, find the value of some of these books. And then we're gonna put them up for sale. The advantage to coming and helping me on the 16th and the 17th is you're gonna get the first look at the books. If you see one you want, we'll mark your name on it and we'll set it off to the side for you. So I'll need four to six people, the 16th and the 17th. I'm opening my home from 10 to four. And like I said, I'll find, provide refreshments. I'm gonna put this book out front. It, while it's here, if you wanna put your contact information, I'll send you my address. And just to give you an idea, this is one of the books that I found. Unfortunately, I'm buying it. <laughs> it's called The Rabbit Box. And it's this beautiful little book. There are things like this in there that you're gonna find. So I strongly encourage anybody that's interested in books to come and help us. And that's it. Yes. When is the book sale? Uh, what'll happen is we're, we're probably going to do, uh, I'll send a email blast out to all of our members with a list of the books. You'll be able, and we'll give you a price and you'll be able to say, okay, I want this one, this one, and this one. And then you can come by my house and pick it up. I don't want to mail it, start mailing them because we've got probably 200 or 300 books there and it just be logistically. So you'll, you'll send me, all the members will get first choice. And then you'll send me which ones you want. We'll mark your name on them and you just come and pick them up and pay for them. Okay, any other questions? Will this eventually be on our website? 
That I think will be up to probably, is it Kathy that'll put them up there? And we'll put it up if they're available. But I will, we will, Fred, Fred was with me. We've already got 75 books on the list. And once we get them all done and we get a price, we'll put the put that list out to the general membership. And you guys can all reply back to me and say, okay, I want this Ansel Adams book, this, this Elliot Porter book or whatever. And I'll mark your name on it. You can come buy it and pick it up. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Okay, next slide. Um, Thanks, Dennis. Uh, so I, uh, one of our members, Jeremy Rowe, wanted to mention uh, an event coming up and we were gonna patch Jeremy in, but apparently it's not gonna work easily. So Jeremy, if you're listening, uh, maybe you can type in the chat um, all the information that people need to know about um, what the event is. And, uh, and then we can, uh, but there's the URL and it's October 15th, 17th, it's, it's virtual. Uh, and uh, I think the next slide. So this is um, here at Art Intersection, street photography capturing the unexpected, a three session workshop with Neil Miller. Uh, yeah, Neil Miller, it's a familiar name, but uh, um, October 30th, November 13th and November 20th. So that, that's an event that's coming up here. And then these are uh, the advantages of becoming a member. There are several membership categories, general, patron, benefactor, student, and out of state. Um, you can ask a board member about the benefits of, uh, of membership. And we encourage everybody. I think there are a few people here that are not members, uh, fam unfamiliar names to me at any rate. Um, so it's it welcome and it's, it's great if you'd like to consider becoming a member. Um, or perhaps you have, uh, I don't know. Uh, next slide. So tonight uh, we have kind of a, oh, uh, well, I, I'll say it's a book signing as well as, as a reading. So um, just a little plug that the books are, there's 20 copies there, enough for most people in the room. Uh, they're $40 each. And, um, and Becky will be happy to sign them for you. And, uh, afterwards. Um, so tonight's lecture will be about a little over an hour. There'll be some Q&A and then uh, both virtual and in the room. Uh, and the people in the virtual audience can ask questions in the chat. Um, um, and, then, uh, and then there'll be a book signing. So the event goes from four to six. Uh, so tonight is, is, is kind of a, a homecoming uh, for Becky. Um, you know, most people in this room know Becky very well. Uh, she's um, among her many gifts. She's an excellent assembler of community. And we are all uh, here because she has assembled us <laughs> into a community in a sense. I mean, when In Focus kind of ended, we as Arizona Photography Alliance sort of, you know, thought it was such a great, a great thing. Um, that we wanted to extend it. Uh, and that's how Arizona Photography Alliance was born. But In Focus was more tied to the Phoenix Art Museum and Becky's programming with CCP and the Norton Family Gallery. And for years, you know, In Focus supported uh, Becky's programming. Uh, and it was our pleasure to do that. Um, but uh, so recently, uh, Becky has been serving as the uh, the director, or the, I'm sorry, the chief curator at the CCP, uh, and we are seeing less of her as a result. Um, but I she's. Mean, there was a pandemic. There was a pandemic. <laughs> that it was, that's right. It was in all the papers. <laughs> uh, but but we're. She's also written a book about the early work of Ansel Adams and uh, his career, his early career. Uh, I haven't read it, but I'm going to be reading it. Start tonight, <laughs> and. Uh, and I have uh, heard on very good authority in multiple places that it's an excellent book. And uh, we're really glad to have Becky Sam come and talk to us about it. So thanks, Becky. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then this. You, you, can, you can do that slide. Okay. And then after I talk, there's a opening here that we can enjoy. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna, I will. 
stay still. All right. It is just such a delight to be here and to be with all of you in person. It feels so good to be back in a space with you all. And um, I'm just I'm just elated. Um, so tonight, as Richard said, I'm going to give this talk. Um, the talk is going to combine reading some passages from the book, uh, talking about the research process that led to the book. Uh, and then I'm also going to talk about the life of the book since it was published a little over a year and a half ago. Then I'll do a Q&A, bring your good questions. I always love to have questions to answer. Um, I should warn you, it's always a dangerous thing to give someone who has as much background about a topic as I do the microphone, because we may just be here all night, but it's fine by me. Um, so anyway, bring your questions. And then um, as Richard said, we have books. I'm happy to sign them. Um, I brought, actually just remembered, I brought fancy Ansel Adams bookmarks that were special that we gave out at the Ansel Adams birthday event last year. So only people who buy the book from me get those bookmarks. Um, so I have those. And then I have a few show and tell items that you can check out as well. Um, and then we're gonna quick change this room over for the, for the opening. Okay, let me just, I've got a time there. All right, so I wanna start by giving just a quick overview of the book. This is the cover of the book. Um, and the basic question that the book was meant to answer is how does Ansel Adams go from making pictures like the one we're seeing here on the left, which is of a group of trees in Yosemite Valley around 1920, to making pictures like the one on the right, which is, uh, Aspen's Northern New Mexico, 1958. Um, those of us in the business refer to this as horizontal Aspen's to distinguish it from the vertical picture Adams made that same day. Um, so we know the picture on the right and it has so many of Adams's characteristic qualities, but he started with pictures like the one on the left. And so I was curious, how does someone go from making pictures like those on the left to making pictures like the one on the right? And I hope I won't embarrass you folks, but come on in and, and have a seat. There, there are chairs up over here. Vicki, would you like the lights like this? Or oh, down a little bit? yeah, I don't know what our best light situation is. I think we should bring them down. Yeah, uh, somebody, somebody will. Better and the pictures look better. <laughs> yeah. Did we lose me too much, Evan? Is there a way to keep, there's a spot here. There's a, that's better, okay. Right. So the book is meant to look at Adams's progress from these early works into his later works. And the book actually begins with pictures from this. This is his childhood album from his very first trip to Yosemite in 1916 when he was a 14 year old boy. And this is at the Center for Creative Photography as part of our archive. And in it, we can see Ansel Adams beginning. This is his very first um, photographic work in Yosemite National Park. They're not his earliest photographs, but very nearly. And there are a couple of notable things. One of them is that he's organized the album, not like a chronological account of the trip, but rather into groupings on the various uh, landmarks within Yosemite Valley. So you can see this page is marked Half Dome. There are actually two pages of Half Dome photographs. So he's grouped things according to the various sites that you would want to see in Yosemite. And then we can see him experimenting with things like lighting and composition. You can see in this small grouping in the middle picture, he's got Half Dome backlit. He moves Half Dome around the picture to try and see what it's like if it's on the left or if it's on the right, what's it like in the lower corner or in the upper corner. He continues here with uh, putting different things in the foreground. In the middle, you can see he's got the Merced River. In the lower right, he's got trees. In the lower left, he's got tents. In the upper right, he's got somebody's sleeve maybe in the <laughs> foreground, not clear. Um, but you can see him experimenting. These are all a, the equivalent of drugstore snapshot prints. So this isn't him printing. This is just him making pictures with his Kodak box brownie camera. But we can see that he understands the principles of composition and lighting and framing. And he's beginning to think about how to use those. 
The next chapter of the book looks at his first portfolio. This was done in 1927 called Parmelian Prince of the High Sierras. It was his first commercial attempt at marketing his work. And so it's really interesting for the book because it gives us an example of him thinking about his audience for the first time. So we see him bringing together particular works, sequencing them, pre making presenting decisions about how the, the whole thing should look. You can see the colophon there on the right. And I we took this picture for the book to show how translucent the paper is that the Parmelian prints were printed on. So they're designed to be handled, taken out of their paper folders, seen with light moving through them and from behind. So this is where we see him first as a commercial photographer. The next chapter looks at his work for the Sierra Club. He was hired as the official photographer for the Sierra Club outings, which was the multi-week trip in the summer that included as many as 200 people out in the wilderness, all camping and hiking together. And so in 1928, the first year Adams was the official photographer, they went to the Canadian Rockies. And so the chapter focuses on the way in which Adams uses his knowledge about the Sierra Club as a longtime member at that point to shape the photographs that he took on the trip to make pictures that would be of interest for purchase by the members of the trip. The next chapter of the book looks at his work in Taos in New Mexico. He did a book called Taos Pueblo in 1930 with the writer Mary Austin, who was an essayist and an Indian activist. It's just a 12 photographs bound into a large scale book with an orange linen cover and leather binding. And this book very much shows Adams acutely aware of his audience. So now he's part of a community of book collectors in San Francisco, the Roxburgh Club and the Book Club of California. So he's thinking about what these book collectors would want and really creating a product that targets their interests and is gonna fit into what they're looking for. And so here we see Adams having come quite a long ways from the Parmelian prints where he wasn't really sure what his audience would want and creating something very specific in just a matter of three years. So this book was very expensive and it sells out. Well, I have a little detail about that later. Um, so what I wanna do now is read a little bit about um, Adams's, uh, Adams's characteristic style. And one of the things that I found interesting when I went to write this book is I would say everyone in this room would recognize an Ansel Adams if you saw one, but no one had ever written about what characteristics defines that Ansel Adams signature style, what his look is. And so in order to talk about how he goes from one thing to that signature look, it felt important to define in terms, which is what us art historians do, what that signature style is. So I'm gonna read a passage, but just to summarize, that signature style is about heroizing the landscape and about emotionally engaging us. And he's trying to get us interested in his view of the value of the wilderness. And so there are certain visual characteristics he uses like a panoramic view of a distant landscape, an omniscient point of view. So that God's eye view of the scene that makes us feel like it's the best way to see that particular place then dramatic light and weather effects. And then finally, this broad range of gray tones. And in the book, I go into that broad range of gray tones. For those of you who are photographers, it's called the zone system. And Adams really perfects this zone system look. Um, and all of these characteristics are used to evoke drama and awe. So I'm gonna read a short passage here. Using the Tetons and the Snake River as an example, it is possible to describe these stylistic elements that Adams brought together to support his communicative goal. This photograph visually expresses the transformative potential of experiences in nature and the value of wilderness as an intrinsic good. In sum, it presents a heroic vision of the American wilderness as an invaluable asset to its citizens. Adams chose a vantage point that facilitated a panoramic view of the Teton mountain range with the winding Snake River. 
The picture includes a swath of cloud-filled sky and distant mountains with patches of bright snow. In the mid-range, the Silvery River curves through tree-covered banks. With little immediate foreground, Adams created a perspective that suggests his omniscient grasp of the scene, and as such implies that what is presented is made from the ideal position and is the best, or perhaps the only, way this particular vista should be seen. It is a stylistic choice that imparts authority and gravity to the picture and confers importance on the subject. Adams favored landscape views that featured visible weather, such as snowstorms, billowing clouds, and rain. In some instances, his photographs include a wide band of sky to accommodate clouds, emphasizing an atmospheric expanse. In other cases, clouds and mist appear around landforms, creating depth within the three-dimensional space and helping to define and shape the, the appearance of the land itself, as with this image, clearing winter storm. One advantage of weather for Adams was its ephemeral nature. Clouds, rain, and snow are all temporal elements, and they impart a sense of transience and motion to Adams's necessarily still frames. In the Tetons and the Snake River, the sky glows behind dark storm clouds, and the left-hand portion of the mountains is bathed in sunlight, as is the surface of the Snake River causing it to shimmer within the darker surrounding territory. Because of the changeability of the light and weather depicted, the viewer is aware that the scene Adams captured must not have looked like this for long, and indeed will never look exactly like this again. Thus, the viewer can both appreciate the magical qualities of spectacular clouds and illuminating rays as inspiring features of the natural world, and also attribute to Adams the ability to perceive and record just the right moment when the scene offered this exquisite combination of visual effects. A key component of Adams's mature style is an operatic treatment of his subject, a desire to heighten the dramatic qualities of the scene and create a photographic work of art that is both wi widely comprehensible and spectacular. In some instances, it is achieved by his use of viewpoint. At other times, it is light or weather effects that convey that engaging sense of drama. In some pictures, such as the Tetons and the Snake River, it is the use of powerful shifts in contrast, glittering passages of light interspersed with or appearing alongside areas of dense shadow or darkness. Adams's use of heightened contrast gives his images an engaging forcefulness, making his artworks bold and serious. The perception that land, the landscape is imbued with drama creates an expectation that the situation is not static and that viewers are observing a fleeting moment within an evolving situation. Adams's use of operatic and awe-inspiring qualities in his prints plays upon the expectations of viewers. The Tetons and the Snake River as a work of photographic art is impactful because the actual scene, when observed by a typical National Park tourist, does not look as it does in Adams's picture. His complete set of skills in making the negative and the print coalesce to create an artwork that surpasses people's real life experience, presenting an idealized heroic version of what really exists, but one still rooted in the appearance of the scene. In so doing, Adams's artworks convey not what he saw, but what he felt. Perhaps more importantly, they convey what Adams hoped his viewers would feel when faced with these landscapes that were deeply meaningful and inspiring to him. Okay, so um, now we're gonna take a step back. We're gonna take a step back uh, 16 years. So this is me in 2005 at the opening of an Ansel Adams exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. In 2003, I was hired by the MFA, where I had been a graduate student intern, to work on a major Ansel Adams exhibition that was to use the on, on loan then collection of um, Sandra Lane. And this is Sandra here. This is Ansel Adams' son, Michael, and his wife, Jeannie, and his daughter, Anne. This is Karen Haas, the curator of the show, and me. And this is Virginia Adams uh, Ansel's granddaughter. So there we are at the opening. I had actually already planned another dissertation topic when I got invited to work on this big Ansel Adams show. 
I was going to work on the American Indian photographs of Frank Reinhardt. Um, and this is an example of one of his pictures on the left and his studio from the Omaha World's Fair in 1898, where he had a studio that was set up to photograph the Indian Congress, which was like an encampment of the local Indian people living there at the World's Fair. And I was going to compare and contrast that work with the work of Edward Curtis, we see a picture of his here on the right um, with the works that were shown at the Jamestown World's Fair in 1905. And this is the display of the Bureau of Indian Affairs at that Jamestown World's Fair. And here you can see this picture is this picture. So I thought it really curious that the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a federal government agency, was using Edward Curtis's pictorialist pictures of American Indians as part of their factual display. So that was what I was interested in looking at. Um, but then I got hired in 2003, shortly after I'd submitted my prospectus for this dissertation, to work on Ansel Adams for the next three years. And it didn't seem to make sense to spend all this time during the day working on Ansel Adams to come home and try and do a dissertation on Frank Reinhardt and Edward Curtis. So I proposed to my advisor that I change my dissertation topic. We agreed to keep it loose until I figured out what I was gonna do with uh, Ansel Adams. And ultimately I proposed three different ideas to her and we settled on focusing on Ansel Adams's early work about which there is very little written. Um, all right. So the, the big bulk of the research was done in a long trip that Karen Haas and I made to California. We did an 18-day day trip where we traveled throughout the state, meeting Ansel Adams' assistants, visiting sites of his photographs, and going to archives where there were materials related to the prints that we had in the Lane collection. The Lane collection was about 400 Ansel Adams prints. So we had a finite group of pictures that we were trying to learn more about. So um, this is Karen Haas in Yosemite Valley at the LeConte Lodge. Um, it's actually not called the LeConte Lodge anymore. I wonder if I happen to put in my notes what it's called. It didn't. Um, it was the home of the Sierra Club in Yosemite Valley for many years and was named after LeConte. Um, so we were in Yosemite mostly to see the sites of his photographs and get a sense of the place. Neither she or I had been there before, so it felt really important that we experience the place. Um, we also visited all kinds of archives. This is me at uh, Berkeley, UC Berkeley, where we went to the Bancroft Library where the Sierra Club archive was held. And that research turned into a component of the exhibition catalog, as well as one of the chapters of my dissertation. And really, we were just going to related archives and trying to learn everything we could about the pictures that we had in the collection. It was incredibly pleasurable to be able to do that, to have that time to, to do that kind of research. Um, Karen made this picture of me in Yosemite and then her husband, who's a photographer, uh, dropped all the color out of the landscape to make it look like I was photographing Ansel Adams's landscape there in Yosemite. So that was pretty fun. Um, it was all pre iPhone. This is back in 2004, this long research trip. And the rule at the time, especially at the Center for Creative Photography, was that unpublished manuscripts, including correspondence, could not be photocopied. So that meant transcribing hundreds of letters into our laptops in order to keep the content. So there was lots of reading and then just transcribing the letters into our own notes. Um, anything that we thought might be important. And truthfully, as my dissertation research continued, I got to the point where I was transcribing almost everything. I, as a historian, have a very good memory. And the danger of that is that you'll remember something and that you didn't write it down. And if you didn't write it down, you can't cite it. So it got, came to the point where if I felt like it was relevant at all and I was reading it, then I, then I transcribed it so that I'd have it for later. Um, so then in late 2003, um, I attended a tour given by Frank Golke at MoMA Queens of the Ansel Adams at 100 show. And this is a, a 
installation view of that exhibition. This is the show that John Tchaikovsky had curated to celebrate the centennial of Ansel Adams's birth. It started at SF MoMA. It was also in Chicago at the Art Institute. It may have had a European venue, although I can't remember. Um, so Frank Golke, who I'm sure many of you know, was a photographer at that time in Boston. He was someone I knew. He had been quoted by John Tchaikovsky in the introduction of the Ansel Adams at 100 catalog. And so I was interested to hear more about the exhibition and see it in person. And it was during that tour that I had my first major epiphany about Adams that related to the dissertation. And as Frank was giving the tour and talking about uh, John Tchaikovsky's thesis, which was, I, this is very blunt, but John Tchaikovsky's thesis was Ansel Adams didn't make a good picture after 1940. Basically all the earlier pictures were the good things, all the things that came later were not so good. And so he, the show was almost exclusively that earlier work. And in the catalog, he actually calls the Mount Denali Adams photo when badly printed, it looks like a dirty pile of snow, which just <laughs> felt a little mean. Um, so I was interested in thinking about this. And as Frank was talking, I had this like light bulb where what happens in 1940? Well, in 1941, he gets hired by the federal government to do the National Parks Project. And it felt to me that that commission had to have been related to this major shift in Adams' style. And, and so then my task was, if that's right, if the National Parks Project is where the shift happens, why? And, and how does he get to this major stylistic shift all at once? Um, usually people's style changes slowly over time, but with Adams, we do see a pretty marked break. So that, that was my task now, was to figure out how to explain this idea that I had. So, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the research process, um, and I'm going to go through by different types of materials that I use to research. And as I'm sure you all know, researching is a process of discovery. So what I was doing was immersing myself in archives that had materials related to my various case studies, the, the chapters that I outlined above. And um, so one of the things that I wanted to use were journals. Now, Ansel Adams was not a journal writer. He was a letter writer, a very prolific letter writer. But in the archive at the Bancroft, in the Sierra Club archive, were Joseph LeConte's journals. And I was able to use Joseph LeConte's journals because he and Ansel Adams backpacked together in the 1920s. And so there are actually references to Ansel Adams in LeConte's journals as well as mentions of what the camping experience was like more generally. So even though Adams didn't write about what it was like, LeConte did, and I knew they were together. So that gave me a sense of it. Um, let's see, I guess I'm gonna show that picture. Uh, so each day LeConte would write about four lines summarizing that particular day. And he would mention things like, the food, the weather, their activities. He would talk about the trails, the wildlife, and the people that they met. And that idea that they're out in the back country of Yosemite, but are regularly meeting people was actually a component of what it meant to backpack and um, be out in the wilderness in the summer in Yosemite. Uh, he described things like eating, quote, a wonderful pan of biscuits on return to camp, or quote, a tremendous rainstorm that swept the head of Bubbs Creek and the most magnificent rainbow I have ever seen spanning the West by debt, end quote. He mentions activities like fishing, swimming, tramping, writing letters and botanizing. And the 1925 journal in particular makes several mentions of times when Adams was off photographing, including on July 6th, uh, LeConte wrote, the three were off again for Kearsarge this cold, clear morning at seven. I simply loafed about and killed time till Helen and Joseph returned at one. Helen and Joseph were his children. A perfect day, clear as a bell, Ansel stayed on pass to get proper lighting effects, end quote. In that year, 1925, Adams was on an, this extended trip with Joseph LeConte and his daughter, Helen, and his son, Joseph. And one of the entries reads, quote, 
Got up late and after a good breakfast, I went around on the west side of the lake and found a beautiful white granite rock bedded in the meadow grass near the shore of the lake. At the foot of this, Helen, Joseph, and I buried the box containing the ashes of my beloved wife. I then drilled the rock and started work on placing the bronze tablet. In the afternoon, I finished the erection of the tablet and with Ansel's help, placed a flat boulder over the grave." End quote. So this is Marion Lake, named after his wife, Marion. Adams photographs it twice for the Parmelian Prince portfolio. And he was there both this year and in 1926. So we're not sure which year the, the picture was made, but it feels so significant that Ansel was part of this really important family trip to uh, bury Marion's ashes at the site of Marion Lake. And without the journal entry, we just, we wouldn't have any of that. So as an art historian, I also use photographs to help me learn about things. Um, and actually at the center, we have an incredible group of portraits of Ansel Adams. And so these became part of my research. We probably have all seen pictures like this. There's actually one by Imogen Cunningham on the back wall, just as you come in the door. And I think about pictures like this. And in fact, I once had, um, Joel Sternfeld tell me, I asked him if we could take a selfie at a studio visit. And he said, yes, but you can't share it. And I said, that's, that's fine. I said, but why don't you want me to share it? And he said, because I don't want people to think of me as an old guy. He's like, think about all those pictures of Ansel Adams as an old guy. And then that's how people think of you. He said, I want people to think of my work, not me as an old guy. So, you know, pictures like this of Ansel Adams, he was so visible. He was so present in his later years. And I feel like pictures like this of him atop his car gives this impression that he drove up to every scene that he ever photographed. And so for me, looking at pictures like this of him as a skinny kid with his Sierra Club cup on his belt, with cigarette in hand, his hat, you can see a tent there in the background over his right shoulder, gave me a really different sense of him. Or a picture like this one with his mule and his tripod, and you can see the mule is carrying his camera equipment. In the 20s, Adams is still shooting with glass, glass plate negatives, so the equipment is tremendously heavy and fragile, so he needs a mule in order to pack it through the back country. Look at him with his pants tucked into his socks and, you know, these kind of messy um, Chuck, um, Taylor Converse high tops for hiking <laughs> shoes. I mean, it just, it gives a very different sense of him than Ansel Adams Incorporated, which is the sense you get from the later years. Or this one is one of my particular favorites. You know, he's there in what tiny little bit of shade there is. His camera's on the tripod. You can see his backpack and a box of, of equipment up on the rock. I don't know if he's looking at a map or some other instructions, but you just get a sense of him living in the outdoors in a way that was really helpful for me thinking about who that young man was. The other kind of photograph that was helpful, I'm going to talk in just a minute about his chapter uh, about the commercial job he had at Yosemite Park and Curry Company. And in the correspondence, they talked about Ansel Adams being responsible for window displays. And I wasn't sure exactly what a window display was. It turns out it's very much like we would think of um, the Christmas window displays in New York City at, at the holidays. So it's a window display like this. The, those are large Ansel Adams prints in the back to set the scene of this uh, advertisement of winter sports clothing. And then also the idea that you would take that winter holiday in Yosemite National Park. So a picture like this was in the file at the Yosemite Museum as part of the Yosemite Park and Curry Company archive. And just, you know, I could have read a thousand descriptions, but seeing this photograph made such a difference in understanding what we were talking about. And, and it's illustrated then in my book. So naturally, another thing that we use is correspondence. Finding great correspondence gives me the nitty gritty of how things got planned or how they were carried out. Um, including something like this back and forth between Ansel Adams and Mary Austin with the details of the pricing of the Taos Pueblo book that they worked on. And it includes how much Mary Austin is going to be paid, how much they might charge for the book, 
giving the various options of a smaller edition versus a larger edition and how they would market the book. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll say now, given that Mary Austin was an Indian activist and Adams is photographing at Indian Pueblos, I really expected the correspondence was gonna talk at some point about Adams's feelings about the American Indians he photographed or his relationship to the people he was photographing. Never, there was literally never a word about it. So in that case, it was by omission that it was interesting to think about what, what did the Indianness of this project mean to Adams? What we see instead is this incredible focus on the marketing and the sales and the promotion of this particular project. So I'm gonna read this bottom paragraph of Adams's letter to Mary Austin. Quote, I have been carefully weighing in my Two hundred and fifty copies at fifty dollars a copy will require the sale of ninety copies to meet the material cost of the edition. Two one hundred copies at seventy five dollars a copy will require the sale of forty five copies to meet the material cost of the edition. End quote. So then Mary Austin writes back to him uh, five days later. Adams writes on April fourth. She writes on April ninth. She replies, quote. 250 copies of a book at $50 a copy seems to me to be beyond belief, and 100 copies at $75 a copy leaves me gasping, end quote. They ultimately decided to do, they made just 100 copies at the incredible price of $75, which in today's dollars is about $1,100 a book. So we're talking about a really high-end publication, it was 1930, it was the Great Depression, and yet Adams manages to sell out the entire edition because he knew that audience that well and, and knew that that audience was not impacted by the depression. They were still collecting books and that he had a product that was just what they wanted. And indeed he was right. Um, okay. The correspondence also came with it some unpleasant surprises. This is, uh, this is what we like to call at Boston University the cage. Um, the graduate student offices were this series of little cubicles along one side of the second floor of Newbar Library. And we called them the cages, obviously, because it was just a chain link wall that separated the cubicles from the stacks with a door that locked so that you could leave your books there and not have them disturbed. So one day I was sitting in my cage at the Mugar Library and I was reading one of the rare photocopies that I had gotten at the CCP. This is it. Um, and this is part of that Yosemite Park and Curry Company project. And actually they're writing back and forth about this publication, The Four Seasons in Yosemite National Park, which is a tourist type book. It was meant as a souvenir publication that people could buy when they were in the park. And it showed Yosemite in all four seasons to try and attract people to come, particularly during the winter. So there's lots of winter pictures in the book as you move into the light. And on the title page, the book says, Four Seasons in Yosemite National Park, a photographic story of Yosemite's spectacular scenery, photographed by Hansel Adams, edited by Stanley Plum. Stanley Plum was the head of the marketing department of Yosemite Park and Freight Company. So I'm reading this letter where Ansel Adams has written to Don Tresseter, who's his boss, the big boss at Yosemite Park and Freight Company. And this is a whole chapter of my dissertation is about this book. And I'm reading this letter and in it, Adams says, quote, this highlighted part, in addition, several of the pictures are not mine, and they are rather bad photographs, and yet my name appears on the title page, making me responsible for all the pictures in the book as they appear, end quote. I think I probably swore out loud, right? I'm in the midst of a dissertation. This book is a whole chapter that I'm focusing on, and now I'm learning that not all the pictures in the book are by Ansel Adams. Wow. And there's no way to know which ones are and which ones aren't, except the ones that 
aren't are bad, which is a little bit big. Mm -hmm. So it meant that I had to go back to Yosemite and go back to the Yosemite Park and Curry Company archive to see if I could figure out which of the pictures in the book were part of Adams's production. There are worse things to have to do than to go back to Yosemite. So, so back I went. This is me and my son, Nick. Some of you have seen Nick at various events. Um, this is him as an 18-month-old. Uh, my mom was really generous and met me there and would babysit Nick during the day while I researched. And then we'd all have dinner together at night. So this is Nick sitting in the Merced River. Um, but in that way, I was able to ultimately determine enough of the pictures from the book were by Adams that I could focus my argument on those pictures and just leave, leave out the discussion of the ones that I wasn't sure about. Um, and then finally, another kind of document that I used was um, this. This is a cash log uh, from 1934. It's part of the Ansel Adams archive at the CCP. I wasn't sure what exactly I was going to use this for when I started looking at it, but the more I looked at it, um, on one side are all the money that com comes in on the left, the receipts, and on the right is all the money that goes out. This is in Virginia's handwriting, his wife, and you can see all the different lines um, tell us, so here is YPCCO money coming in, YPCCO money coming in. Uh, this is another job, H.S. Crocker and Company. And then these are all the various expenditures of the household. And by using the cash log, I was able to figure out that in this one example year that he's working for Yosemite Park and Curry Company, the income from that one commercial job made up half of his income for the entire year. It was enough money to cover the mortgage payments for his house. So one of my concerns in focusing so much on Ansel Adams's commercial work was that um, people would challenge the significance of that work to his career. And so I was looking for justification for using it as an example and understanding financially what a big role it played for him was helpful in underscoring its importance. <laughs> so all of this research then produced a dissertation. This is a copy of my doctoral dissertation. Um, I don't hardly remember the title anymore. Ansel Adams's Practical Modernism, the Development of a Commercial Photographer, 1916 to 1936. It's a very dissertation-y title. It's not really my title. It's kind of what the committee wanted, but that was fine. Um, so there, there's the dissertation. And then over the next 10 years, I worked on finding a publisher. I had done some revisions on some of the chapters in the process of finding a publisher, but the process of transforming the book in earnest really started in 2018 after Anne Breckenridge Barrett came as director at the CCP and uh, came on as a co-publisher to the book. So basically Annie committed that the center would put some money towards the publication and then I could really move forward with it. I added two chapters to the book. Um, a new introduction and a conclusion, as well as a chapter about Ansel Adams's work in the national parks, which that uh, Tetons and Snake River passage comes from. I was really surprised when I did work on the national parks. So I did new research in the archive at the CCP about the national parks work. And I was just really surprised that there was, there was factual information in the documentation that had never been published which was so surprising because the National Parks work has actually been more published than anything that Ansel Adams did in his career. And yet there was still information missing. So it felt really good to be able to add that in. Of course, when you're working on a book, there's lots of proofreading that needs to happen. Here, my cat was helping me, obviously. Um, you know, no cat can stand there being paper on a surface without being on it. So she was getting in there and really helping me spend time going through it. Um, part of that editing process was reading the entire book out loud. So I read every single chapter aloud to make sure that the sentences sounded right, to make sure that I wasn't seeing a word that wasn't actually on the page. So sometimes reading aloud can help with that. Um, I was still finding errors all the way up till the end. When I finally had the designed pages, which I'm looking at here, I was catching errors that were um, in, you could see them when you could see the photograph next to the text. Because for many months, 
maybe over a year, I was looking at the text and the images separately. And so I'd read the text and not catch mistakes like this one. So in the text, I'm talking about the Yosemite Park and Curry Company, this brochure that Adams did for them was another thing he complained about. Um, and so I had written that it was a young woman on skis. And then when I finally saw it across from the picture, I thought, she's not on skis, she's holding skis. We wouldn't even be able to tell if she was on skis mm -hmm. from that picture. So it was things like that that I was still trying to catch as I was going through the text towards the end. Um, all right. And then when I was finished, I began to get some distance on the book. You know, it goes away. It goes off to be printed and bound. There's a long time where you don't have contact with it after being immersed in it for so long. And that finally gives you some distance on this thing that you've produced. And for me, that meant that I began to feel like this chapter on the Yosemite Park and Curry Company was really important. Um, Adams never denied his commercial work. He writes about it in his autobiography. He was truthfully quite upfront about the fact that he needed to do commercial work to support himself and in order to do his artistic work. But he also didn't think of it as having any significance or bearing on his artistic work. And I think that's natural. He saw them as two separate compartments in his work. But for me, in going back through it and thinking about this big change that happens for Adams in 1941, the eight years that he spent working for the Yosemite Park and Curry Company reporting to the head of the marketing department felt really significant. And in particular, what was important was that that marketing department is coaching Adams about how to make photographs that communicate clearly to a specific but broad public audience. So they're talking to him and teaching him about how to make a picture that anybody can look at and glean information from, which is what his early mountain pictures were not doing so well and which his mature mountain pictures do so very well. So I began to feel like it's not a coincidence, it's not an accident that he had this period of being trained by marketing department people mm -hmm. in how to make photographs that are effective at communicating ideas. So for instance, this, <clears throat> this picture of the golf course at Wawana Hotel, the reason Yosemite Park and Curry Company is interested in a picture like this is that it shows people that you can have this great vacation in Yosemite, it's comfortable, it's gonna have all the elements of a regular vacation, but you're gonna do it in this spectacular wilderness setting. And Adams was perfectly adept at providing those kinds of photographs that show the, the comfortable, the, the vacation aspects, but really showing off the landscape details as well. His, his, Yosemite Park and Curry Company work took lots of different forms, including the book that I just showed you. There are also these menu covers that Ansel Adams does, where his photograph is on the front of the menu. And then inside, we can see this is breakfast from 1936. You can have uh, preserves of raspberry, yellow tomato, strawberry, and peach apple jelly, um, fresh pineapples. Um, frosted raspberries and sheared eggs with nut sausage. I mean, I kind of love all the menu stuff, but so Adams's pictures on the cover, these were printed for each place setting at each meal each day so that you could take them home as a souvenir. And you could get an envelope from the maitre d' if you wanted to mail it to somebody or to keep it. These are still available on eBay. That's part of what I brought for show and tell is some examples. But this was part of Adams's responsibility. He not only made the pictures for the cover, and this is him repurposing one of the Parmelian print images for one of the menus, but he also was writing the text that went on the inside. So, and he did the menus for decades for the Awani, um, the Awani restaurant menus. He also uh, did this series of postcards. These are real photo postcards. I'm sure there's not a person here that doesn't know what a real photo postcard is, but they're actual gelatin silver prints. They were printed with a postcard back. So you just used this when you were making, exposing your, your gelatin silver photograph with through whatever negative, and then you could mail them. 
Adams was making them and selling them at Best Studio, which is now the Ansel Adams Gallery in Yosemite National Park. It was a souvenir item. Um, this is part of that. He's reusing the photographs from Yosemite Park and Curry Company to make these postcards. I brought a couple of those. These two are still available on eBay. Nobody knows that they're by Ansel Adams because they're not marked. So I know they're by Ansel Adams because they're in the Ansel Adams archive. Now you all know that they're by Ansel Adams and you, yeah, you can find them there. Sometimes they're three or $4, sometimes they're 10 or $12, but you are buying an Ansel Adams photograph. It's an actual gelatin silver print by Ansel Adams. And they're, they're just terrific. I brought a couple that have writing on the back. Not all of them do, but this is another part of that um, component of the commercial work that he's doing for Yosemite Park and Curry Company. And then he also made these albums. I included this because it's just such a fabulous thing to imagine Ansel Adams making this picture of Half Dome, given all the other pictures we've seen of him by half of Half Dome. And here he's got the cowboys on either side. This is at the um, Glacier Point Hotel, which later burned down. So it's not there anymore. But here he has literally framed the view with the comforts of the hotel and the guides who will show you Yosemite to make sure that for people who are visiting, it feels very comfortable, very safe, very secure. And these albums were placed in the hotel so that people could see what the other attractions were, just the way you might advertise things that are available for, for sale um, in, a, in a hotel. Because I felt that that Yosemite Park and Curry Company chapter was so important, we decided to include um, one of the postcards on the cover of the book. And when you see the book, you'll see that it's the postcard part is actually printed separately and tipped onto the cover so that you get the sense of that uh, objectness, which I was very pleased with. And my editor tells me that um, we're not going to change the cover because the book is selling well. And so you don't mess with something when it's working. So that is the cover of the book for now. OK, so what I'm going to do at this moment is read a short passage, um, a second, second of two readings from the book. And then I'm going to give you a little update on what's happened with the book since it was published last February. All right. We're going to talk about Moonrise Hernandez, New Mexico. Perhaps you have heard of it. Mm -hmm. By far, Adams's most famous photograph is Moonrise Hernandez, New Mexico. Oft told, the story of its making is one of photographic legend. The creation of the Moonrise Negative happened on a trip when he was accompanied by his son, Michael, and his friend, Cedric Wright. And that's what we're seeing here. Ansel Adams is to the right, Cedric Wright is in the middle, and Michael Adams is on the left. He was eight years old at this time. Um, seems pretty fabulous, right, as an eight-year-old to go on an extended road trip with your dad photographing through the American Southwest. <laughs> And here they are packing all the gear into the car. They had been making photographs without much success in the Chama River Valley near Georgia O'Keeffe's Coast Ranch in northern New Mexico. Driving back to Santa Fe, Adams hastily responded to what he saw before him. Quote, in the east, the moon was rising over distant clouds and snow peaks. And in the west, the late afternoon sun glanced over a south flowing cloud bank and blazed a brilliant white upon the crosses in the church cemetery, end quote. With the sun setting, he knew he had to act fast. Swerving his station wagon to the side of the road, he commanded his son and Wright to help him set up his eight by 10 inch view camera. Tripod, camera body, lens board, lens, dark cloth, loaded film holder, and light meter had to be pulled out and assembled before he could frame and focus the view made all the more urgent by the rapid descent of the November sun. In the frantic hustle, the light meter could not be found. Evaluating the scene before him, Adams miraculously remembered the luminance of the full moon, 250 candles per square foot, and was able to approximate an exposure for the scene. He released the shutter and captured the clouds, moon, and mountains beyond the little town of Hernandez. Before he could make a second backup negative, the sun dipped below the horizon and the opportunity was gone. With that single negative, Adams preserved a view that has become a photographic icon. 
The image at its core exhibits many of his mature stylistic elements. Adams filled the frame with a vast expanse of sky, the moon hovering above a bank of horizontally striated clouds and a long low chain of mountains. He placed the chapel and cross-filled graveyard of Hernandez in the middle ground, bounded by a shrub-filled plain. The picture features a panoramic sweep of landscape and compellingly asserts that this perspective with its precise arrangement of human edifice within a monumental and impressive environment is the critical viewpoint for observing the scene. The drama comes in part from the relative scale of the elements. The endless quality of the sky reminds viewers of how small and seemingly insignificant we are in the expanse of the universe. All these visual qualities serve to inspire in the viewer a sense of awe in the face of a spectacular and unique visual experience, an appreciation for the natural scene and a feeling of amazement. Unlike the mountain pictures of the late 1920s and 1930s found in his Parmelian Prince portfolio or his Sierra Club album, Moonrise clearly conveys Adams's intensity of experience his message about the transcendental possibilities for people when they are immersed in nature and his deep appreciation for the American landscape. This slide compares his final print to his proof print. The proof print is a straight or unaltered printing from the negative with no darkroom work such as dodging or burning that allows the manipulation of exposure to select areas of a print. As such, it affords a view of Hernandez that is much closer to the one Adams originally observed, albeit in black and white. From this view of the landscape, he envisioned, or to use his parlance, visualized the finished artwork of Moonrise Hernandez, New Mexico. Moonrise existed only in his imagination. He photographed a raw scene that he could transform in the darkroom into a symbol that would convey how he felt under a vast and beautiful New Mexico sky. By altering the relationship of the sky and the graveyard of the Hernandez Chapel to create a dark expanse over a shimmering village burial ground, Adams created from the raw material of the landscape an emotionally engaging image, one that borders on magic or mysticism. On that November day, Adams drew on more than two decades of wilderness exploration and photographic experience to create what would become his masterpiece. Deep and repeated contemplation had etched in him the value and meaning of immersing oneself in nature. Equally ingrained were lessons about making photographs that effectively convey an essential idea. Adams's early years had readied him for the scene he discovered along the highway as the sun set over northern New Mexico. So um, that's the book. Um, then the book was published on February 18th, 2020. Ooh, I know, it's not so great. Um, I did give a first talk in person on February 28th. The center celebrates an Ansel Adams birthday event. And so in 2020, my book was the feature of that event. So I gave an evening lecture. I was able to do a book signing. It was super fun, really fun. Um, the attendance wasn't great. And actually at the next day, the 29th, the attendance was even worse. And my boss and I were talking backstage before I went on about whether or not could anybody be not coming because of this virus that people were hearing about on the news. I mean, it was really that moment, right? Um, but this night I did sign books. Um, so I, I did an in-person talk that night um, and I'd even chosen a special Sharpie. You see it there. I have copies with me today um, to match the blue end papers of the book. It's this, I'm referencing it here in the PowerPoint, <laughs> that, that same blue. Um, I don't know, that was kind of fun. Um, I built a website working with uh, some assistants, Stephanie Burchette, Adam Monahan, and Brian Ganter in order to, for there to be a web presence for the book. So it, it's about the book. It also includes sections about me, about past exhibitions I've curated. Um, it included a page for the book tour. This is what it <laughs> looks like. <laughs> oh. Tucson Festival of Books, canceled Phoenix Art Museum, canceled Yosemite National Park. I was going to be there for their Earth Day celebration. 
on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day canceled. Um, Stanford canceled. Houston MFA is there. It says postponed. I don't. I don't know if they're going to have me. Um, but um, and so that was rough. That was really rough. I, I expected to spend my 2020 celebrating the book and meeting with audiences and being like this, where I get to understand whether or not people are are getting it right. And, and instead, I was on Zoom. So here is where the, the talks pick up. I did something for Photo LA. I did something for the PAC LA group. And there were pluses, right? I did something for Princeton University Art Museum. There were 800 people on the Zoom. 6,000 people watched it on the Princeton University Facebook page. 6,000 people. I mean, it was, I, it was hard to conceive. Um, I got invited to places that wouldn't, I don't think, have invited me in person, like ICP in New York City. So that was great. I spoke at the Center for Fine Art Photography, Brian Taylor's former organization, um, where I had spoken in person before. And that was a case where I was going to be in person and we just switched it to online as a way to salvage the, the plan. Um, but obviously, this is what most of the talks look like. It was me on Zoom. Um, this was actually the Princeton talk. I remember I wore that star shirt um, for that Princeton talk because I had star in the title of the talk. There's another example of me in my dining room giving a talk. Um, Isn't that odd, Becky? You know, as opposed to tonight where you see, well, half of all these handsome faces, you, when you're talking, that's your view. You have nobody, you, you yeah. didn't know 6,000 people yeah. were in the audience? No, and in fact, I was terrified the first Zoom talk I gave because I know that I can do this in person. I was not at all sure that I could do it if I was looking at the little green light on my computer. And so it just, I was quaking um, when I did that first talk. But, you know, like anything, you kind of get into it and you figure it out and it worked out okay. And um, actually, it's funny. In this one, I've got um, a little vase of flowers on the wall behind me. <laughs> and in this one, this is actually the Ansel Adams coffee can. Do you guys know the Ansel Adams coffee can? Yes, lots of nodding heads. Yeah, so, you know, I would sometimes put little things like that in the screen. Um, so another one of the good things has been that on Amazon and on people's blogs, there have been great reviews of the book. Um, I mean, 51 ratings for a photo book is a lot on Amazon. Um, there are a bunch of reviews as well. I'm pleased to say they're very positive. You can also do stupid stuff like this, which I truthfully, I don't encourage anyone to do, but you can kind of watch your ratings. Um, so this is right after the talk I did on Zoom for the Portland, Oregon Art Museum earlier this year. I checked Amazon right after the talk and up went my numbers. I was for a little while number three in photography criticism and essays. Um, Right when the book came out, I was number one for a little while. Mostly I'm like 10,500th. So I don't actually encourage anyone to do this because it mostly makes you feel terrible, but um, that is a thing that you can do. Um, and then um, another thing that happens when you publish a book is people send you pictures of it, um, either when they've bought it and they've received it or when they see it out in the world at a bookstore. So these are various things that some people posted online or, you know, emailed to me directly. It's so gratifying to have somebody send you a picture of your book. I mean, it just, it really feels great. That middle column is like men holding my book with their thumb in the picture. Um, apparently that's a, that's a way that you take a picture of a book. Um, and um, and then now I'm starting to resume in-person talks, which is really great. This is me in Portland, Oregon. Um, it was late July or early August visiting the Ansel Adams in Our Time show um, that was on view at Portland. That was curated by Karen Haas, the woman I worked for way long ago, 20 years ago, and the big Ansel Adams show. And in this case, I wasn't giving a talk, but I was meeting with their collector society. So I went through the show and then I met with them and had a little very informal conversation in the lobby. But this is my first in-person talk in, to an audience. And then I have another one in Illinois at the Best Bauer Dunn Museum that has an Ansel Adams show. Um, let's see, uh, November 5th and 6th 
something like that. And then I have another talk at the MFA Richmond in Virginia, December 10th. They also have an Ansel Adams show on the wall. So I'm beginning to come back mm -hmm. into real talks. Mm -hmm. um, and I should say, I wanna thank the people who are watching on Zoom because that seems like a really great new thing that it can be both, that I can be talking to you all and people can tune in from, I know we have people on the East Coast on this, talk tonight, as well as people who are here in the Valley who maybe don't want to be in person yet. And that seems really great. Um, so the best news actually came earlier this week. My uh, Yale University Press editor wrote and said they're investigating a reprint of the book. I know, I'm really elated about that. Um, yeah, so they're investigating reprinting, which was why the cover image came up as a, a question. Um, she was actually writing to ask me about errors that had surfaced in the book since publication, because we will be able to correct those on a reprint. Um, and I have found one. This is in the footnotes. And um, it said 1982 to 75, which doesn't make any sense because that's not how years go. They go from earlier to later. So it should have said 1972 to 75. So we'll get that fixed. Um, but at this point, I want to ask you all for your help in this possibility of a reprint. So it's not a decided thing yet. Um, we originally published, I think, 3,400 books, um, but we had permission from the Ansel Adams Publishing Rights Trust to print 5,000. And so they can go up to that 5,000 without going back for more permission. And so they're investigating printing that additional 1,600 books. But in order to do that, there needs to come continue to be demand for the book. So I have to keep selling it. Um, so I'm asking you all if you would consider buying a book. You could buy two and give one to someone else. That would be lovely. Um, so that would be great. If you buy the book and you read it, if you would consider giving it a rating or a review on Amazon, I actually really think that helps people who are finding it on Amazon get a sense of whether or not it's a book that they want. So that would be great. And it can even just be a line or two. Um, doesn't have to be a great work of literature, just something to help people know whether or not they'd want it. And then finally, if you read the book and you notice an error, please tell me. Because if we do get to reprint the book, we can fix anything that you might catch. And um, Karen Hodges, I know that you're watching on Zoom. And she is a great editor. So Karen, if you read the book, please let me know if you catch any errors and we'll get it fixed. So with that, I want to thank you all. And um, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. So thank you. Right. Yes. Uh, not a question, but a statement. I had a friend in Detroit, Dennis Leiter. It was invited by his neighbor, this was a long time ago, to come over because they had purchased a print. And they spent $600 and they wanted to know if they had paid too much for that print. And it was Moonrise or not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I hear, I mean, of course, I hear all kinds of Ansel Adams stories. And the Ansel Adams print stories come in two categories. It's the category of the people like you just described who bought the print and are so grateful and thankful they did. And then there's the whole category of stories of people who bought the print and sold it or didn't buy the print when they had the chance and are still to this day regretting that they didn't buy that print when they had the opportunity. So yeah, it's I love all the stories that I, I get to hear, yeah. Does anybody have other questions? Richard? Um, you know, I've, I've always wondered about uh, a lot of the iconic pictures that Adams took were taken during some of the hardest years of World War II, uh, you know, both internationally and, and from the United States perspective, the worst years. And, and I wonder how he, I always wondered how he got around wartime rationing and how he justified doing what he does while the world burns um, and in in the face of total war, the likes of which none of us have really ever experienced. Like that. Do you ever, what, what, what do you think? I have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question, just in case the mic isn't picking it up, clearly Richard is asking about how some of those most iconic pictures were made during the war years and 
how did Adam's work around the rationing and how did he justify making these wilderness pictures when the world is burning? And so this is when he's on the commission from the federal government. So what happened is in 1941, he was invited by Harold Ickes, the Secretary of the Interior, to be part of what was known as the Mural Project. There was a new uh, Department of Interior building in Washington, DC, and they were decorating it with murals, mostly by painters. And they felt that it would be nice to have a photographic mural. And so they reached out to Ansel Adams and Adams took the, the invitation to do one mural and escalated it into this uh, eight month job where he got paid to travel around the Western United States and make photographs, not just of the national parks, but also of other things that were under the Department of Interior umbrella. So that included um, conservation programs like dams. So he photographed at Hoover Dam, which was then Boulder Dam, um, and the Indian reservations, which were also part of the Department of Interior. And so, and Adams, I mean, he just latched on to this invitation to do this project with such intensity. It was very clear in reading the correspondence that everything in his life had been building to this moment for him. He had been training to be hired by the federal government to photograph the national parks. His All of his attachment to Yosemite, all of his experience working for Yosemite Park and Curry Company, now he was going to make pictures about the value of the wilderness and the United States decision to set aside land for, for that purpose for legislators, public officials, and the American public that they represented. I mean, this really for him was like, it was all coming together. And I don't know as much about the rationing. He, he was on a federal salary. It was the highest salary that you could get without congressional approval. And I have the numbers in the book. Um, he didn't end up actually claiming as many days as he was allowed. He was, he was a very modest person. And so he was out for something like 40 days on one of the trips and billed the federal government for eight of the 42 days, you know, because he made moonrise on one of those days. And so, you know, that was not a federal government day. That was an Ansel Adams day. Um, so I mean, probably there were gas rations, but as a federal employee, he probably had access to workarounds. Um, but he actually, so he's out photographing in the fall of 41. And of course we know in December of 41, Pearl Harbor happens. And so his commission wasn't renewed. So he was allowed to work through the end of the fiscal year, end of June um, in 42, but then there was no further money. And they never made the murals during Adams's lifetime. And until Harold Ickes left office, Adams kept saying, please let me make the murals for you. Please, couldn't we pick up the project again? I feel like it's so important. But when he was arguing to continue the project and not have it end in 42, he was arguing that because we were fighting for American freedom, we needed these pictures that showed what we were fighting for. And he really genuinely, without any irony, believed that this kind of American action, our decision to set this land aside for the, for the populace and the, the potential that it had for Americans to um, have the, the experiences of, um, of, of transcendentalism, of of patriotism, of nationalism, were why, were why you should you should fund a project like this, and the war just made that obvious to him. So he he didn't see any um, conflict in those ideas. He actually saw them as very related, and it was very eloquent about that. Yeah, is there a Zoom yeah. question? Martin at Martin asks uh, from the Zoom, what's next? Do you feel there are any other areas of Ansel's work that needs looking at? <laughs> this, is, this, is a hard, this is a hard question. Um, what I would really like to do is a book on Ansel Adams' workshops. So starting in 1940, Ansel Adams does a series of workshops in Yosemite. He does some of them in Carmel when he's living in Carmel. Um, and he was inviting people for a fee to come and study with him. And he was sharing, as he did through his technical books, exactly how he made his photographs. I mean, 
This is the equivalent of Andy Warhol mm -hmm. selling 12 spots to Americans to come to the factory and hang out with him for a week and watch him work and teach them how to make silk screens. I mean, we can't imagine Andy Warhol doing that. But Ansel Adams had such a deep investment in the value of photography and in the value of modernism and in the value of technique and the, the ability that if you, um, if you uh, learned the technique that you could use the medium for expressive potential and that that was a, an incredibly empowering thing that he gave his own time to teach you whether you were a postman from Dubuque or a dentist from Scottsdale, you could go and take these classes. Right now, there are still people alive. There may be somebody in this room who took one of those workshops. And I'd really, oh, right. Okay, so yes, there is someone in the room who took one of those workshops. Um, those people are alive. They could be interviewed. I feel like that would be a really interesting subject. And a, again, a way to provide some granularity about who Adams was that is often lost when we just think about the calendars and the posters. Um, but in addition to the pandemic that happened last year, there was also a, a social justice movement that made itself very present. It's a social justice movement that we needed, um, that the cultural heritage sector needs. We need to rethink what is at the center of our programming. We need to think about whose voices are represented. And I think given that, another Ansel Adams book is probably not appropriate right now. So as much as I'm interested in doing that kind of work, I think this is a moment for thinking about making sure that we're talking about other voices and making space for other people to be represented. Yeah, Betsy. But how long did it take you to get this book? Yeah, 17 years. You know, if you started another one. You know, and I have, to, I have seen some really interesting photographs by people who were in the workshops. Uh, of they have taken of Ansel Adams of him teaching. Yes. And all those would be an interesting little mm -hmm. photograph to study too. Yeah. So Betsy just said in case you um Betty, sorry, Betty. No. Um it's okay. Just was saying that um asked how long my last book took to write, which was 17 years. Not that I was working on it the whole time, but um that maybe it's worth starting that project and seeing where it goes. And that it is true because they were photographic workshops. There's such great photographic documentation of those. Um, you know, even just very casually, you can find great stuff online. So yeah, there's a there is a treasure trove of information there to be had. Yeah, and, Brian. And Becky, you make such a good point about what what next book would be relevant for the times. You know, and it's undeniable what we've just seen in terms of the social revolution, as you mentioned, and yet. Uh, uh, you, you never bet against the lovable Ansel Adams. You gotta love that guy who is always on the right side. Name one person in America, one white guy in America, when we were at war with Japan, who thought it was wrong. And, and you all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So Brian is just referencing Ansel Adams' man's in our pictures. He was outraged that. Japanese American citizens were being imprisoned at Manzanar and got permission to go and photograph there. And I mean, I think people may have qualms with the way he approached it. He, um, he heroized the people who were being imprisoned, which it, to his mind, he was trying to show that these were loyal American citizens and how wrong it was that they were being held um, as internees. And it's, it's true, he, he absolutely did the right thing in that moment. And I will say um, at the CCP, we over the last few years have established a, a Ansel Adams acquisition endowment by selling duplicate prints that Ansel Adams left the center. He knew they were duplicates. He actually left them with us to trade with other museums in order to expand the holdings of the CCP. But trading is not a thing museums do so much. So we had all these prints <laughs> and couldn't really figure out what to do with them. So the Ansel Adams Trust gave us permission to do a series of sales, which we did through Christie's. And we were able to raise, um, it's in the ballpark of $2 million. That has created revenue and we're using that revenue to purchase the works of um, this year, black, indigenous, and photographers of color. And then in future years, it can also be used to purchase work by women and by LGBTQIA plus individuals. So here's Ansel Adams's gift to the center 
now being used to create a way to bring works by more diverse individuals into the center's collection. So you gotta love that guy. Yeah, I mean he's he's he does good stuff. He does good stuff. Yeah. 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 Right. Was uh, group F64, which I don't know, I haven't read your book, but if you mentioned or not, was that much of an influence for him? And what did he think of it? So I mentioned it passingly, it does, it falls in the period that I talk about. Um, I mean, I think Adams, so he was a lovable guy. And for me, after having spent 20 years with him, I feel really fortunate that he was such an affirmative person. Um, he was very outgoing. He was very loyal and dedicated to his, his friends. He was a people pleaser. I totally get that aspect of his personality. And so he was also a joiner. He was an only child. And so when Edward Weston and Willard Van Dyke and Imogen Cunningham are creating Group F64, you know, he wants in, he wants to be a part of that. And you all probably are familiar with the series of articles that he and William Mortensen wrote back and forth in the pages of Camera Craft fighting about Group F64 straight photography versus California pictorialism. And he was absolutely deeply invested in this photographic way of seeing in this modernist approach. But in the years following that, he moves away from that really strict interpretation of the medium specificity towards things like Moonrise, where there's all of this dark room work that, that produces the finished print, where there's all this imagination that's going into it, which one could argue is kind of more like pictorialism than it is Edward Weston's straight printed contact prints from a eight by 10 negative. So um, I think it was really important to him in that moment, but he didn't feel constricted by it. He allowed himself to continue to grow and think about the medium in ways that resonated for him. And, you know, he and Edward Weston were such radically different people, um, you know, Edward Weston wasn't thinking about how to influence most Americans around the idea of wilderness. And Adams really was. That idea of persuading people meant something to him. So it's a very different way of being a photographer in the world. And so Adams, I think, needed to move on from that way of thinking. I don't, none of that's in the book. That's just, that's me thinking about that. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, you seem to suggest early in your talk that um, I think it was the wise remark by John Zarkowski about um, Hensel Adams, who drew a good photograph after 1940, if I recall your quote correctly. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you come out of with a point of view on that? It, it seemed like that, that quote was influential in terms of your decision to focus on the earlier work, but you didn't express a point of view. Yeah, I disagree with him, actually. Um, or maybe it's not exactly that I disagree with him. I mean, there's lots of great photography before 1940, but Adams's own goal was to influence an audience. The work before 1940 does that less well than the work after 1940. So if we're judging Ansel Adams by Ansel Adams standards, the later work is more important or it's better work. Um, I think that, um, I mean, do I have a preference? I mean, there are lots of really stunning, stunning early examples. And not only are they stunning, but because he doesn't have a commercial practice much before 1940, they often exist in a single print or maybe two prints. And so they're, I mean, it's, I think, hard not to instinctively react to rarity. You know, when you've seen Moonrise prints, I mean, I've probably seen several hundred in my lifetime and they're impressive objects. They vary, you know, they're all different, but you know, there are prints that I've seen where, um, actually, can I get to my desktop from here? Of I, just, I just escape. <laughs> um, we'll see if we can get to the picture that's on my desktop. That's a picture in the center's collection. Oh, it's not very happy with me right now. There we go. Okay, pardon me while I clean up this mess. Um, so this, this picture, 
this is why you should never do this, right? Because I've got my texts and all kinds of embarrassing stuff. But this picture um, is one that Adams made. And unfortunately, we're, we're kind of missing the best. Oh, hang on. Look at this. I've got it right here. This is the same picture. Ah, there we go. Now we're, now we're in business. Um, look at this picture. Do you see what we're seeing at the bottom of the picture? That's the wall at the edge of the parking lot yeah. outside the Wawana tunnel in Yosemite. Wow. This is the little didactic plaque that the Park Service put up about Yosemite National Park. I mean, like, how fabulous is that? I mean, it's this beautiful, misty, wintry, weathery day. And Adams has pulled all the way back so that you can see what the scene actually looks like. You know, everybody else and Adams very often is right up against that wall with your tripod so that you don't see it, so that you're just looking into this vast, beautiful wilderness, which again, to think in current terms, had indigenous people living in it who were forcibly removed, and that's why it looks unpeopled. Um, but here we see him kind of tipping his hat at the fact that he's standing in a parking lot that has a retaining wall at the edge of it. So pictures like this get me really excited. This is like a 1930 picture. Um, and so those kind of special morsels, the things that we don't associate with Ansel Adams, I get, I get excited about, and they do happen more early in his career. Um, but truthfully, for the book, I'm, I'm, I'm not a person, I'm an art historian. So I'm really just pushing and pulling against John Tchaikovsky's theory, not making, not making a judgment. And why did he feel that way? Was it a function of the fact that he didn't like the darkroom technique? Is yeah, that thank, for yeah no, was? thank you for asking that. Why did John Tchaikovsky think that all the good pictures were before 1940? I actually think the answer to that is because he was an art snob. You know, because everybody loved the late pictures. And if you're a good, you know, art person, you like the stuff that nobody else likes, right? I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. This is the John Zarkowski was creative. At MoMA, yeah. yeah. And so he and Adams, I mean, now you guys are totally getting me off script. Yeah, I mean, this is like, yeah, I know, exactly, right. Um, I, I think that John Tchaikovsky had done a show with Ansel Adams when Ansel Adams was living. It was the show Ansel Adams wanted to do. And I think after Adams was gone, John Tchaikovsky said, now I'm going to do the show I want to do. And I, truthfully, I, it, it hurt me a little bit because I kind of felt like he was punking people, right? It was like, you all think that, that you know, Tetons and Snake River is so great. You think Denali is so great. And I'm going to put it down and tell you that these early pictures that you don't even think of as by Ansel Adams are the best ones. I mean, it felt a little mean, a little mean to Ansel Adams and truthfully a little mean like to the American public who love Ansel Adams and love those pictures. And it, it just felt, it didn't feel right to me. And, you know, again, that's why I feel like it's important to understand Adams's intention. He really wanted everybody to get into it. He was trying to reach a broad audience. He didn't want to play the snooty art game. He wanted to talk to people and and persuade them that the wilderness was worth protecting and that this was um, something we could all have a part of because we were Americans and we'd done these great things and we could benefit from it. And so, you know, that was that was what felt important to me in playing off this John Tchaikovsky thing um, was that there was a there was an intention that Adams had and that it was worth thinking about that intention and and honoring how he got to that that point. Okay. I, I actually I mean, things are happening behind me, but I do actually think we're at the time where I'm supposed to stop and let you all buy books. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. It's just been such a pleasure. Thank you. I do have these show and tell items up here. So I have a couple of the postcards and I have the book and I have a couple menus and you're welcome to come up and look at those. Yeah. Very good. We'll find that. We'll take four files.